Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine for Rounds. We have a special guest today who's going to talk to us about an artificial kidney. But as I do every Thursday, I'm going to mention a couple of uh, announcements before he is introduced. Uh, we're very excited about uh, anticipating his presentation. But this week we've been learning about the Nobel Prize winners as we do this time of year. And I thought it was important for us to highlight a little bit about that because every Thursday I stand up here before you and mention a few people who I believe have made great differences in our understanding of human biology and how we uh, take advantage of that information to improve healthcare delivery. Alfred Nobel was born in October on this month, back in 1833. And he signed his third and last will while he was in Paris. He was at a Swedish Norwegian club in Paris, signed his will, and then dies. And there was tremendous surprise and controversy after they opened and read his will. Because he had left most of his wealth, a significant part of it, to the development of this prize. The family opposed the establishment of the prize. And the people he named in his will to actually carry out that process and be the awarders refused to do so. Okay? We sent a letter for them to send the money to the Department of Medicine for that. <laughs> and so it took another five years before the first Nobel Prize was awarded in 1901. And in his will, he said that the remaining estate should be used to endow prizes to those who, during the preceding year, shall have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. Now think about that. People who win this prize are those who their peers believe that they have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. And that's why we discussed them here, okay? And there's two of these people who I want to mention today. One is Cesar Milstein. Cesar Milstein was um, an Argentinian immunologist who was born on this day back in 1927. And he was an immunologist and molecular biologist who shared the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology with Horror and Jenner for theories on the immune system, but more importantly, for monoclonal antibody production. He was able to put together tumor cells and antibody producing beta lymphocytes to produce what? The hybridoma, which has been a technology that has revolutionized industry and in how do we develop new drugs and assays and so forth. The other one is Jens Sko, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this well, S-K-O-U, who was born this day, back in 1918. He was a Danish physicist who won the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 1997, he was born in 1918, with Boyer and Walker. How about the discovery of a very interesting enzyme that every time I think about it, I think about it, the kidney, and that's why I bring it to you today. He discovered ATPase. Okay, sodium potassium, and then I'll see triphosphate ATPase, which is the enzyme that controls sodium potassium in the living cell. And I always think about the real cell, but cells have it. And they actually use crab nerve membranes to actually isolate this entity, which I thought was very important. So with that, I'll leave you with Eleanor Lenner, the division chief for nephrology, who's going to introduce our special guest. I really wish they'd done something about those stairs. <laughs> I live in dread fear that I'm going to trip walking up those stairs if I'm introduced to somebody. So um, the implantable artificial kidney, uh, I think that this is an unbelievably exciting topic. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce you guys to <coughs> Dr. William Fassell, who is um, the leader um, in this area of discovery. Uh, Dr. Cassell went to MIT for his undergraduate work, uh, University of Michigan, uh, I'm sorry, Case Western, uh, for his uh, internship and residency, University of Michigan for fellowship, um, moved to Case, um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, moved to Cleveland Clinic. I told you I would butcher your background. And uh, now has been for two years um, at Vanderbilt. Um, he uh, um, has, initially did his work with David Hume, um, who was also a leader in the field of the uh, artificial kidney, but has branched out um, on his own and has a primary interest in applying technology 
to end stage uh, kidney disease. Um, I think for individuals who are confined by dialysis, uh, the discovery of something like this, an implantable artificial kidney, would revolutionize their lives. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stell. Morning. Thanks for the kind introduction. I'm not sure whether my MIT background has left me sufficiently able to operate a microphone. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes? yes. yes. People sleeping in the back, can you hear me? Good. So um, I think I have to start with some obligatory disclosures. So I'm an inventor on some of the technologies I'm going to discuss. Um, so we've also created a small business to try to move the technology along. So you know, I, I desperately hope this makes me fantastically rich someday. <laughs> but I promise you I'm still checking my uh, my 401k contributions from my employer, just like you are. So a little roadmap here. Um, <laughs> every, I was once taught way back when, when I was a medical student, that every, every presentation should start with a case, so you're anchored in the day-to-day -day life that you're accustomed to as a physician. Talk a little bit about our technology approach and our rationale for taking what is really probably the path of maximum resistance towards our goal. And then uh, talk to you a little bit about the future of the technology. Should take probably about 45 minutes, and we'll leave a little bit of room for questions. So, I think this is a scenario that most of you have seen before many times. A gentleman comes in, presents to you with bad ankles, and the patient was well until a couple of weeks ago when he noticed that you know his shoes didn't fit. He's getting kind of tired. Previous medical history is really no guide whatsoever at all for what's going on with the sick person. Um, nor is his family history. Guy works, married, two children, no drug use, no alcohol, bland history. <clears throat> the guy is a little hypertensive. Yeah. Hey, he looks fine, he's got some pitting edema. Real function doesn't look so good though. Spilling a ton of protein. As all of you know in this scenario, this is not something that you sit around and watch or try a little bit of an ACE inhibitor and hope that the world gets better. The patient went to a renal biopsy within the week, which is absolutely appropriate. <coughs> and this kind of strange entity of FSGS was found on biopsy. It's probably among the number one of the number two non-diabetic causes of nephrotic syndrome in the US. And as also happens, despite aggressive therapy for his disease, which has no specific remedy, the gentleman progresses to end-stage renal disease. He's got no potential living donors, which is often the case. Because of that appendicitis in his family history, he's not really a good candidate for PD, so he initiates hemodialysis by his AV fish. So what does the future hold for this guy? He's young, he's got a family, he's successful, he's got a job. What happens to him now? Well, for those of you who don't do this every day as part of their, their uh, their work, it's worthwhile taking a moment to explain dialysis. It's kind of interesting, it's about 50 years old now that we've had this you know, sort of technical remedy for an organ failure. It was the first technology device that represented a, a treatment for complete organ failure. And it's coming out 35, 40 years until the second one came along. And in hemodialysis, blood is pumped from the patient's blood vessels, and usually there's some specially created conduit to give access to blood flow in the patient. And it's pumped over a filter. You know, I brought my kind of stage prop here. This is a hollow fiber dialyzer. It costs about 12 bucks. There's you know half a million dialysis patients in the United States. Each one gets 156 treatments a year. So 75 million of these go into a landfill every year in the US. They're very common. On the other side, so, so the blood goes to the hollow fibers. On the other side, there's a buffered electrolyte solution that um, is pumped from the dialysis machine through the filter to a drain. And small molecules like urea and creatinine diffuse across that semi-permeable membrane into the dialysate and are discarded. <coughs> and bicarbonate diffuses from the buffer into the blood and maintains the patient's pH. And then salt water is extracted from blood through the membrane under hydrostatic pressure to balance the fluid intake that the patient's taken since the last session. If you think about these two things, they kind of paint some of the limits of dialysis that we'll get back to in a couple minutes. 
However, the first thing that this patient can expect is that he's not going to be lonely. In the United States, this is USRGS data from originally from the University of Michigan, we've seen this 8% year-on-year growth in the number of patients with end-stage renal disease in the United States. So that, you know, when I was in medical school, there was maybe 180,000 patients with end-stage renal disease in the United States. Now we're up north of close to 600,000. And the vast majority of those patients are treated with in-center hemodialysis because of the scarcity of donor organs. So we've got 100,000 patients sitting on the wait list waiting for a donor organ, and about 18,000 to 19,000 renal transplants are done in the United States each year. The vast majority of patients who are waiting for a renal transplant die on the list waiting for an organ. That death statistic kind of sticks out even worse. This is more USRGS data. This is an old slide, but I got lazy to it, and I haven't remade the slide in a while because the statistics haven't changed. So on the y-axis here, we've got deaths per 1,000 patient years at risk. On the x-axis here, I guess if we're right-handed, we've got age groups. And in blue, we've got the general U.S. population. In green, we've got recipients of a first deceased donor renal transplant. And then in yellow and orange, we've got the two kinds of dialysis that we do in the United States. So, you know, like most physicians, I'm kind of self-centered. And any time I look at a graph like this, I actually immediately ask myself, well, where am I? So I'm sort of here, right? I'm in my mid-40s, kind of overweight, balding, and struggling for tenure. But at least my mortality is low. I'm likely to be overweight, balding, and struggling for tenure next year also. However, if, for example, I get into a car accident on my way home to Nashville, and I get acute renal failure, and one of the half of patients with acute renal failure who never recovers their renal function, my mortality suddenly skyrockets. My mortality is far worse than if I doubled my age. I don't know how many, do we have any surgeons lurking in the audience anywhere? Okay, anybody do this uh, cardiac risk, pre-op risk stratification for a living in the audience? Okay, how many of you are racing to take an 80-year-old with renal failure to the operating room for a major surgery followed by three drug immunosuppression? Does that sound like a good idea? It's a great idea because they live. They live compared to their age-matched peers who remain on dialysis. So let's dig a little bit. What's driving this mortality? I think when I was in medical school and when I was a resident, we sort of were told that patients with end-stage renal disease should be expected to die because the kidney failure is the last domino in a long series of chronic illnesses like hypertension and diabetes. More recent data where you dialyze patients intensively suggests that perhaps the more, this mortality that we see might be partially attributable to how we do the dialysis itself. So let's think about two things. Let's think about nitrogen, BUN. You all look at BUNs on patients every day. You use them as a surrogate for kidney function. Well, I told you that small molecules diffuse from blood into dialysate. The concentration of urea and dialysate should be zero, right? Um, so if you want to, since it's diffusing, you need a concentration gradient. So if you want to remove more nitrogen, you have to accept worse azotemia. And if you just sort of think about your normal daily nitrogen intake and normal urea generation, which is somewhere, oops, sorry, somewhere around 10 milligrams per minute, it's not hard to simply do the integral, here's that KT over V of dialysis, and figure out what your pre-dialysis BUN's gonna be to match normal protein intake. Does that look like a normal number? Pre-dialysis BUN in the 70s? That's about right. And you know what? If it's lower than that, your patient is starving. Because every single dialysis patient walks this kind of weird balance beam between intoxication with nitrogenous waste and starvation. And if the epidemiologic data makes that clear. So this is uh, Kent Pointer's data. That if you look at serum albumin in a dialysis patient, the lower the albumin, the worse the mortality. The better the albumin, the better that they're able to sustain protein intake and synthesize albumin, the lower their mortality. 
So something about the way that we do dialysis means that you have to choose between starvation and intoxication, and that's not a great choice to be presented with. Okay, what is the other thing they talked about with dialysis? They talked about salt water, right? So you think about your extracellular fluid volume. How much do you guys drink in a day? See, I told you I was gonna, I was gonna be pimping your renal health. Uh, vigorously interrogating them. How much do you drink in a day? Not a Friday for an intern. <laughs> Not me as an undergraduate at MIT. Two liters. Two liters? Two liters is a good number? 1,800? Well, just do the math, right? Suppose you put your patient on a fluid-restricted diet like most dialysis patients are. 1,500 a day, seven days. You only dialyze the guy three times a week, right? That's the standard recipe for in-center dialysis in the United States is thrice weekly. You gotta take out three and a half liters of water every single session. Well, how much water is in that blood? Maybe five or six liters of circulating blood volume. 30% of that's red cells. You gotta get three and a half liters of water out of four liters of plasma. How do you think that's going to go? So every single dialysis patient experiences cyclic volume overload and hypoglemic hypotension 156 times a year. And again, the epidemiologic data suggests that this is a disaster. So Chris McIntyre, who used to be in Nottingham and is now up in London, Ontario, a great snag by London, Ontario to be able to recruit him, has shown that in the course of an individual dialysis session, you get segmental wall motion abnormalities due to myocardial ischemia. And if you do that enough, you get scarring and you, in, inevitable progressive loss of myocardial function. That's not intrinsic to the dialysis patient, that's intrinsic to how we dialyze the dialysis patient. So maybe instead of saying, well, we expect dialysis patients to die because healthy people don't come to dialysis, maybe we should focus on how we take care of the sick person. So, we'll shift gears for a moment. Ben Burton was the first director of the Artificial Kidney Chronic Uremia Program at NIGDK. I will not commit the faux pas of reading my slide to you, but I'll point out that 40 years ago, people were really worried that this kind of technology wasn't moving along. And when I was an advanced life support paramedic in Boston in you're the one who read my CV. When was it? <laughs> 1990, I guess. A dialysis unit then, the kidney center at Com Ave, looked the same then as it looks today. Nothing's happened in how we treat these patients. And so 40 years ago, the NIH was worried that the technology of end-stage renal disease was going to become entrapped in its own net for failure to break out in new directions. If you contrast this, with other fields in medicine, the contrast becomes dramatic. When I was a paramedic back in 1988 and 1989, cardiac rhythm management consisted of me showing up in my orange and white band at the patient's house and doing CPR. And if the patient was fortunate enough to survive a malignant arrhythmia, they'd be admitted to hospital Somebody would be paid minimum wage to watch the television and holler if the squiggly line changed, right? And then their soda wall or whatever would be adjusted and they'd be sent home. Two purely technology-based engineering advances changed cardiac rhythm management. Now, this kind of funny yellow box that's in airports and casinos allows, embeds the expert systems and the signal processing algorithms that can automatically detect a malignant cardiac rhythm and allows an eight-year-old girl to be a good enough cardiologist to successfully treat the leading cause of out-of-hospital death in the United States. That's pretty remarkable. Then, low-power microcircuitry and high-energy density batteries allow those electronic signal processing algorithms to be implemented in a little gadget that sits in a patient's anterior chest wall and stands sentinel over them 24-7, 365, able to diagnose and treat a malignant cardiac rhythm without any human intervention whatsoever at all. So what used to be in the 1980s, me finding a patient dead in the shower, 
has become a patient calling the cardiologist on Monday morning saying, hey, doctor, the thing zapped me in the shower last night. Do I need to come in and see you? So let's contrast that to dialysis. So CULPS, rotating dumb dialyzer, the Colt Brigham kidney of the 1950s, um, continues to persist today in terms of large package size and large technology requirements to move blood from the patient's body through the dialyzer. We've had gadgets for self-care dialysis at home or in the community for a long time. 4% of the dialysis population in the United States opts for self-care dialysis at home. Everybody else gets in-center dialysis. And there's absolutely nothing over here to match a ST <coughs> model. So that's our holy grail. That's our goal. That's our medical moonshot. Let's advance the technology so that we can have a gadget that a surgeon can sew into a patient that will give them enough small molecule clearance that they don't have to go to dialysis. So we're clearly not, I'm not the first guy to have thought of this, right? So you, know, you can look and find pictures of Pim Cole with a little portable dialyzer. You can find pictures of Eli Friedman with a suitcase dialyzer. What makes me think that I can do this after other people who have been trying for 40 years and haven't succeeded? Well, we identified two big challenges early on for an implantable dialyzer, an implantable device to treat renal failure. The first is the dialyzer, right? What body cavity is this going to go in? <laughs> right? How, what orifice? <laughs> okay. Yes. This takes 300 millimeters of mercury to push the viscous colloid of blood from this side of the dialyzer to this side of the dialyzer. I don't have 300 millimeters of mercury pressure available in me anywhere except when I sneeze. So we identified that the dialyzer was a limiting factor in our ability to think about implanting a technology to get small site things. How many liters of water do you go through in an individual dialysis session? <coughs> Renal fellows in the audience? <coughs> Any idea? So typical dialysis prescription, blood flow 400, dialysate flow 800, 800 ml a minute times 240 minutes. You have 200 liters. And that's not counting the water that you wasted making in your RO system making the dialysate. I can't carry 200 liters of water around with me. So the model of the hollow fiber dialyzer and the high flow dialysate is a fundamental barrier to progress in this area. But I would challenge you and say that each one of you has a pair of gadgets in your retroperitoneal space <coughs> that are small enough to fit in your body and operate driving off a of cardiac perfusion pressure, maybe, I don't know what, 30 or 40 millimeters of mercury capillary perfusion pressure. So I think all of you already solved the problem. It's just up to the engineers to kind of catch up. As my former mentor, David Hume, said, let's leverage Mother Nature's 60 million years of R&D to figure out what to do. Well, let's think about here, I'm losing track of my slides already. Let's think about this filter. All right? So when you think about the filtration barrier in the glomerulus, there's this kind of thin basement membrane. There's some endothelial cells. And then there's this strange, highly differentiated epithelial cell called the glomerular podocyte. Much to everybody's chagrin, this is the thing that's broken in almost all renal disease that ends up in renal failure requiring dialysis. And this cell does not assume the same phenotype in culture as it does in the body. In fact, sometimes it doesn't even take the same phenotype in the body like it's supposed to. That's the basis of proteinuric renal disease. We can't grow a filter based on this cell. But we can probably build a filter. Similarly, if you think about the tubule that reabsorbs almost all of that 140 liters a day that your glomerulus filters, that's kind of a remarkable entity. Renal fellows, what's the flat molecule? You all do this, right? You all hold up your hands and say, okay, stop some traffic for me. And you watch the guy and the patient who's your remix sort of 
gets this aspirixis, this nodding of his fingers. What's the molecule that makes you flat? That causes the breakdown of the neuromuscular junction? Good answer, because nobody knows. We've been dialyzing people for 50 years, and nobody knows what the name of that molecule is. It's not urea, I can guarantee you that. But you know what? Dr. Letterer, will you stop some tackle for me? <laughs> it's good thing. No flat. <laughs> right? But your kidney knows. <laughs> right? Yeah, can you imagine you know it? <laughs> See, I didn't warn her. So, so your kidney knows. Right? Your renal tubule knows. The proximal tubule is the only Santa Claus membrane in the world which knows which molecules have been naughty and which molecules have been nice. <laughs> So while I can't build a filter that will discriminate between metabolic substrates that are needed for health and uremic toxins that will kill my patient, because we don't have the basic science knowledge of the identities of uremic toxins to do that, we can grow renal proximal tubule epithelial cells so that they make the barrier to reabsorption of uremic toxins that they do in all of you. And if you doubt what I'm saying, do you guys have a heart failure ICU? Okay. Go to the heart failure ICU and go to the SICU. Heart failure ICU, guys got a B1 of 110 and a creatinine of 4, and I guarantee you that patient is awake reading the New York Times because his proximal tubule is intact reabsorbing salt and water in the context of a low ventricular output. And you go up to the SICU, the patient's got a creatinine of 4 and a B1 of 60, and that patient is passed out because his tubule is injured. In, one, in the case of the heart failure patient, he's got an effective barrier to reabsorption of uremic solutes for the same BU and creatinine. In the case of the patient with ATN, he doesn't. So that's my, that's my phenomenological case, that we can go ahead and use a bioreactor of cultured cells as a barrier to reabsorption of uremic toxins. So when we think about trying to create an implantable artificial kidney, there's many different domains involved in the engineering effort. So there's the filter, there's the cells, there's the surface chemistry that will allow an artificial material to remain in the hostile environment of blood. There's the computational fluid dynamics of the fluid conduit that limit, that put upper and lower bounds on the fluid shear stress experienced by cells. So you don't have shear induced platelet disruption and you don't have stasis inducing clotting. But I'm only gonna focus on these two for this talk. We also work on these. So let's think again about this filter, this glomerular filter. Here's a hollow fiber dialyzer cut in half. Here's a scanning electron microscope and a transmission EM of the glomerular filter. The filtration structure in the glomerulus is called the slit diaphragm. These are elongated slits. And each one of them, here's the little foot processes, is the same distance from the next one. They're all the same size. You look at the pores in a polymer dialyzer, they're kind of irregular, they're kind of round, they're all different sizes. Can that teach us anything about why this gadget is so big? Well, if you look in nature, you see slit-shaped structures, and it's hard to say that early in the morning. <laughs> uh, all over the place. In the baleen plates of filter feeding whales, in the beaks of filter feeding birds like flamingos and ducks. And engineers have also evolved slit shaped structures where pressure driven filtration is involved. For example, this storm drain. And once you get this meme in your head, you find slit shaped structures everywhere. I've never been in a lecture hall where I can't point to something that's been engineered as an elongated slot. Well, does that matter? Well, it turns out, if you take a step back and you think about filtration processes, every filtration process is a trade-off between permeability and selectivity, and that's a bunch of fancy words. How many of you have strained pasta? How many of you have made pasta at some point in your life? <laughs> okay, right. When you strain the pasta, you want the pasta to stay in the colander. You don't want it to go down the drain in your sink. But you want that straining process to happen fast enough that the boiling water doesn't burn your hands. 
right? You want seal activity. You want to keep the pasta in the colander, and you want permeability because you want the water to go through fast enough that you don't burn your hands. Think about permeability and selectivity in the performance of any filtration structure. You want to be somewhere here in the upper right-hand corner, really selective and really permeable. If you just do the first principles fluid mechanics calculations, a membrane of slit-shaped pores has higher permeability selectivity than does a membrane of round pores. And if you look at a membrane where the pores are all the same size, compared to a membrane where there's a dispersion in pore sizes, the membrane of pores that are all the same size outperforms the membrane that's got a distribution of pore sizes. So if you want to optimize the permeability selectivity trade-off of your artificial membrane, you better have a membrane of slot-shaped pores that are all the same <coughs> size. So we just went ahead and made one. We didn't use polymers, because in a polymer membrane, the shape and the size of the pores is, is controlled by the thermodynamics of the solvent demixing process in the polymer melt. And so you get a thermal distribution of sizes and shapes. We instead use silicon nanotechnology. It's an industrially mature bulk, you know, batch process technology that's made, you know, this screen, that projector, that television. You can go to a factory in South Korea and get a very large number of incredibly precise devices at low unit cost. And so we made a membrane that was a flat sheet membrane because that's what the available technology let us do. Some people in the audience maybe are old enough that they dialyze, somebody with a parallel, parallel plate dialyzer, I don't know. And we made slot shaped pores through the membrane that were about seven nanometers in size. Any nephrology fellows know why I picked seven nanometers? Out of all the different sizes in the world? But albumin 7.3 nanometers. So I picked a size that's just a little bit smaller than the pasta that I want to keep in the colander. These pores are all the same size. They're exceptionally smooth walled. Nothing gets hung up in the middle of the pore. And when we actually tested these prototype membranes that we made back in 2002, maybe 2003, lo and behold, the data that we obtained suggested that indeed a membrane of slit-shaped pores does in fact outperform polymer membranes with irregular round pores. So you can go ahead and spend the capital that you earn through that optimization any way you want. You can spend it in terms of a reduced package size so that the device is small enough to fit in a body cavity. And you can spend that in terms of a reduced driving pressure for filtration. So instead of the 300 millimeters of mercury pressure that my dialysis machine needs, I can get by 30 or 35 millimeters of mercury capillary perfusion pressure powered by my heart. So I think changing the underlying technology of the membrane seems like a pretty simple step, is fundamentally enabling for making this leap to be able to create an implantable artificial kidney. So we now have um, actual little gadgets. So here you can see cow blood running through an extra, running through a benchtop circuit. There's our little chip there with our membrane on it. And those of you with eagle eyes can see a little meniscus of ultrafiltrate there. Pressure-driven filtration through our silicon chip. And we now are at the point where we're doing implant studies where the gadget is buried underneath the surgeon's fingers here and there's an accumulation of yellowish fluid in the bag showing that we're able to achieve sustained stable ultrafiltration over a period of many days using this technology in an implant. So everybody's asking the same question in their heads right now. What are you going to do with that yellow fluid? So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what we're going to do with that yellow fluid. Let's talk about the tubule side of the equation. Your renal tubule reabsorbs 138 liters of the 140 liters a day that your glomerular filter. And there's some precedent for this. My mentor, David Humes, had a large scale extracorporeal artificial kidney where he used a conventional hollow fiber dialyzer as the glomerular analog. 
and then took a second hollow fiber dialyzer and seeded the insides of the lumens of the dialyzer with cultured renal proximal tubule cells harvested from transplant discards. And these cells form a confluent monolayer. They have metabolic activity. They synthesize, they hydroxylate vitamin D. They, um, they reduce glutathione. And they move salt and water from the apex to base. And so this large scale artificial kidney has completed a phase one phase two trials. And I'm actually not completely clear on where the technology sits right now. So very quickly, we jumped on that and grew some renal proximal tubule cells. I'll take one step back for a moment. That was a real act of genius on his part to use a hollow fiber dialyzer here. Because if it's not letting albumin through, it's also not letting complement and antibodies through. It's not letting T cells through. So this is a mechanical immunoisolation barrier that protects the cells from the host and the host from the cells. So in these human studies, there's no immunosuppression applied to the patients. And the cells in the of the hollow fiber dialyzer did just fine. So if you've solved your glomerulus problem, you've also solved your scaffold problem for your renal tubule cell bioreactor. So we kind of jumped on that right away. These are human renal proximal tubule cells grown on one of our early stage silicon chips. Blue is the nuclei of the cells. Green is ZO1, a tight junction protein that connects one proximal tubule cell to the next. And red is acetylated tubulin, the protein that makes the central cilia of differentiated proximal tubule cells. And not being content just with pretty pictures, although pretty pictures will get you published, we also looked at some functionality of the cells and whether they're able to form an electrically resistive barrier across that monolayer. So that gave us some hope of success, that we might be able to push this a little further. But if you take a you kind of yet another step back, this is a renal proximal tubule cell from Heptenstahl's pathology of the kidney. And you'll notice that it's got this lush brush border that serves to expand the surface area of the apical membrane of the cell, a couple thousand fold. It's packed with mitochondria. They're supplying the ATP for space allowing sodium potassium ATPase to pump that 140 liters a day of salt and water from apex to base. It's a beautiful cell. Now, this is a proximal tubule cell, a primary cell in culture. And this is one of a picture from my lab, but you can go look in AJP Renal and wherever else and find a lot of other pictures of cultured renal proximal tubule cells. It looks different, right? It's got the faintest trace of some apical microvilli. It doesn't have a beautiful lush brush border. Mitochondria are few and far between. It's got these kind of funny ruffles with two cells stick to each other. They have some extra vacuoles that don't quite look right. So this is a phenomenon that's been known about for years called cell culture stress. That when you grow cells in an artificial environment, the cells suffer <laughs> some phenotypic erosion over time. And my favorite kind of analogy <laughs> is to hair, right? Because if you think about the cell in vivo, it's got this beautiful lush brush border. But when people talk about what happens to cells and cell culture, they typically describe this phenotypic erosion as if there was aging and senescence of the cells, or if there was some sort of program reversion along some kind of ontologic pathway. By the way, do not ever Google bald baby Muppet if you don't want to know what you'll find. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that the data supports the idea that these cells are on some kind of developmental railroad track and stressing these cells either moves them down the railroad track or back up the railroad track. And if you're me and you're a card-carrying engineer, you say to yourself, well, let's think about cells in the body versus cells in the tissue culture plate, and let me count the ways that we do it wrong. So, you know, 
I'm pretty squishy. Okay, probably one kilopascal bulk modulus. Tissue culture polystyrene is stiff. It's stiff enough that you can shatter it. But we grow the cells on it. My, you know, fasting insulin is hopefully somewhere around 75 picomole. It's six orders of magnitude higher in cell culture because you don't want to exhaust the media, right? You can't pay somebody to come and do media changes every 30 seconds. So you put so much stuff in the media that you're guaranteed that it won't be exhausted by the two days later time that your technician comes and changes the media again. Similarly, glucose in me is somewhere around 80-ish, I hope. In cell culture, it's much higher, again, because you want to guard against media exhaustion because you don't want your cells to starve overnight while you're sleeping. In the body, your cells, your tubule cells, have this river of ultrafiltrate flowing over them constantly. It's probably even a pulsatile river, if you believe um, Bruce Molitoris. But these guys are just sitting in a dish. Right? Somebody pipettes the media in, puts the dish in the incubator, and closes the door, and they sit there with no fluid flow over them. You know, I can go on and on and on and on. Right? So this drunk is going to look for the keys under the street light. Rather than worrying about some complicated developmental protocol, some railroad track of development that these cells are imagined to be sliding along, Let's just look at all of these variables and see whether turning the knob on them actually moves the needle on the phenotype of the cells. So about four years ago, a brilliant postdoc in my lab named Nick Farrell designed a, um, a specialized oozing chamber where you could expose the cells to a calibrated level of fluid shear stress and individually regulate the composition of the media on the apical side and the basolateral side of the cells. So not only do they get fluid shear stress, they get a continuous stream of nutrients guarding against media exhaustion. And we went, there's a couple other cool things. There's enough surface area, you can get RNA out, you can get proteins out from the westerns. It's optically clear, you can interrogate the cells on the microscope, you can even stain them and look at them through the PDMS um, that we made the, the bioreactor out of. So we did a couple of simple questions. Do they care about fluid shear stress? Well, we just did a simple stain. These are human renal tubule cells harvested from a transplant discard. They're probably pretty sick because the guy had to be pretty sick to have his kidneys harvested. You just stain for F-actin, a protein component of the cytoskeleton. In static culture, it's this kind of funny disorganized you know, mesh that doesn't appear to have structure at any length scale that we can observe. You expose them to a whiff of fluid shear stress, like this, like barely enough that you would feel it if it was a breeze while you were walking down the street. And these cells completely reorganize their cytoskeleton in response to that. I don't think this is a subtle difference in response to a very subtle change in the cell culture environment in which we grow the cells. So again, pretty pictures might get you published, but they're not very satisfying if you're trying to make a therapeutic device to treat a sick person. Using um, a cell line, because it's kind of challenging if your ability to do an experiment depends on some kid falling off his bike somewhere and his kidney getting donated. Um, using a cell culture cell line, we're able to show that in response to fluid shear stress, apical basal transport rises. So. Some of you may remember second year of medical school and glomerular tubular balance. There's an idea that the fluid shear stress over the apical surface of the cell is a feature of glomerular tubular balance and potentially a mechanism. So Shelley Weinbaum and Alan Weinstein have been beating this drum for 25 years now, maybe. Um, and we're among the first to really show this in an in vitro model. But also, we were able to show that this apical basal transport isn't just a leak. We didn't just make a stupid monolayer with holes in it because we're able to inhibit sodium potassium ATPase with Wabane and cut down on the transport dramatically. So I think we can make a monolayer of proximal tubule cells that move salt and water and they move it in a way that is consistent with the regulation that we expect from fluid shear stress over the apical surface of the cell. Um, you know, like I said, I'm squishy. I don't work out much. 
if you throw the cells on stiff substrates versus soft substrates, you see a huge difference in phenotype of the cells. So just pick fibronectin, right? It's a protein constituent of plasma. It's around in the serum that you put in the media. You know, you put fetal calf serum in the media because it's got some magic factor in it that the cells like. Well, it's also an extracellular matrix protein that will allow the cells to attach via integrins to the surface that you grow them on. If you grow them on a squishy gel, they kind of ball up and form these kind of cyst-like structures. This is, by the way, this is on, not in. When you grow them on a stiff gel, they kind of reach out and grab and spread. But whether they choose to do this is exquisitely sensitive to the extracellular matrix protein that you present them with. So if you just simply coat your gel with collagen, they don't care. They won't even stick. They won't stay down on it. Gravity will let them sediment down onto the gel. But as soon as you pick up the dish, they all roll off to the side. And they die. They don't like being detached. But use another extracellular matrix protein like laminin. They stick and they attach, but they don't do a real good job of polarizing and sending their matrix, their membrane-bound proteins to the compartment on the cell membrane where they belong. So while I wouldn't pretend to say that, like, oh, this is going to make the sick person better and this won't, I think there's some data that simply turning the knob on some of these parameters related to cell culture moves the needle on what the phenotype of the cultured cell is, and we need to take a little bit of a deeper dive and figure out what's going on there. So, I've got a couple minutes. I think I've tried to paint you a scheme for implantable artificial kidney, where we use our kind of high-tech silicon membrane as a glomerular analog that lets us produce a meaningful volume of ultrafiltrate just using kind of capillary or arterial or pressure from the patient's heart. That ultrafiltrate is directed towards a bioreactor of cultured proximal tubule cells that are grown on an identical scaffold because it presents an immunoisolation barrier protecting the host from the cells and the cells from the host. These proximal tubule cells reabsorb salt and water back into the capillary while, re re while presenting a barrier to reabsorption of uremic solutes. The uremic solutes are progressively concentrated in this ultrafiltrate as the cells extract salt and water. So you get some kind of yellow fluid that you can actually, you know, the patient can pee out and get enough small solute clearance that the patient can stay off the dialysis. And I think I gave you some proof of concept that this part of the project works and some proof of principle that this part of the project works. But if you take a step back for a moment, what's in this? Ultrafiltrate. It's everything small that's in plasma water. So there's glucose, there's amino acids, hormones. If you ran into this fluid in the fridge in your lab, you wouldn't call it ultrafiltrate, you'd call it cell culture media. So maybe what we've done is we've actually created a generalized platform for creating an implantable artificial organ where you can pick the cell type here. Because we've come up with a way to convectively perfuse <coughs> the cell, of name your, you know, your cell type here, um, and overcome one of the fundamental barriers to um, organ transplantation with individual cells. So typically, immunoisolation protocols encapsulate, for example, a beta cell or an islet in a little shell of alginate or some other immunoisolation barrier. And the same argument I made to you before about urea applies to oxygen in there. If the cell that's encapsulated wants oxygen, it has to get hypoxic enough for oxygen to fuse in. That's a major barrier to any one of the current therapies where you inject some stem cell derived cell in an immunoisolated environment. We achieve our immunoisolation with convection. So you can flow oxygenated ultrafiltrate over these cells and supply them with oxygen without requiring them to become hypoxic to get the oxygen delivered to them. So we can look at a number of different cell types, whether it be a beta cell to try to treat diabetes, whether it be hepatocytes to try to create 
something to supply a little bit of liver function to the patient. Or you could even imagine stocking this with, for example, some yeast in which a gene is overexpressed to supply some particular peptide or protein. So with that, um, I think I've tried to convince you that end stage renal disease is a significant public health concern in the United States. I didn't dive into the economics, but it hoovers up $42 billion a year out of the US economy. Um, is 42 billion ring of bells, anybody? Or the $30 billion that CMS pays through the Medicare ESRD program? What's $30 billion? $30 billion is the entire NIH budget. So end stage renal disease, with its 16% per year mortality, hoovers up as much money every year as the entire NIH budget. We're reaching scalability limits of the existing technology. <coughs> We're not able to match the existing technology to the metabolic needs of the patient. Um, we've developed a novel technology for a synthetic glomerulus that is optimized so that you can actually get something small enough to fit into a patient's body cavity instead of this. And we've developed, I think, a platform technology for biosensors and tissue engineering. So with that, I'd like to close with some acknowledgments. David Humes up at the University of Michigan gave me a job, and nobody else would give me the time of day because I was some crazy second-year medical resident talking about silicon kidneys. I kid you not. Shubo Roy and Aaron Fleischman are a pair of biomedical engineers. Shubo's now out at UCSF, who put their shoulder to the wheel and worked on the technology development for years before I had any funding whatsoever at all. They had the vision to say, hey, there might be something to this. Let's work on this um, while we try to develop funding. And then Roger Marchant was a uh, macromolecular scientist at Case who's focused on blood materials interactions for years. He actually died earlier this year, uh, suddenly. Andrew Zinni is a chemical engineer at Penn State who's worked on the membrane physics. He wrote the textbook on ultrafiltration and microfiltration. Terry Conlisk is a uh, mechanical engineer at Ohio State who's helped us immensely on the fluid dynamics within the channel of the, of the membrane. If you notice, we've got a Wolverine, a Nittany Lion, and a Buckeye all collaborating on the same project, <laughs> which is uh, Nobel worthy in itself, I guess. Um, uh, a brilliant transplant surgeon named Seth Karp at uh, Vanderbilt's been helping us actually do the surgeries to implant the cartridges in the animals. And we've had a fantastic relationship with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, who've been helping us really from the get-go understand the regulatory environment in which a device like this would have to exist to actually move it from a bench or from an animal lab into a human subject. <coughs> I'm fortunate to have sustained NIH funding for a decade. Um, we're starting with some pilot and feasibility grants, a couple of uh, large-scale grants, and now we've recently been <coughs> created this small business to leverage the SBIR funding mechanism. We've had some small business innovation research grants from uh, the NIH and from the National Science Foundation. As Eleanor knows, dialysis patients are, tend not to be a rich population. Dialysis is, to some extent, a disease of poor access to care. So unlike cancer and heart disease, we struggle to attract big donors to the project. But we have had about $2 million in philanthropic donations to the project over the last five or six years, usually from families who have been afflicted by renal disease and understand the burden of illness that end-stage renal disease and dialysis presents. And with that, I think I've left five minutes for some questions. Thanks for your attention. An excellent demonstration of understanding fundamental biological processes to apply to develop physiology, physiology that helps you repair an organ or even replace one. Uh, and you also brought us a lot of information about how to begin to apply what we do in the lab and in the clinic to bioengineering and perhaps connecting with industry and how to promote this further faster than what typical resources allow us to do in academia. So I really appreciate that. As I see the evolution of the, this area, the area of lung and heart and all these things, I see two camps of people. People who are trying to develop a new organ entirely, mm -hmm. and people who are trying to use the remnants of a crappy organ mm -hmm. and repopulate it, perhaps even with stem cells, mm -hmm. to try to regenerate some sense of a functional entity. Tell me where those two camps are uh, in the sense of the stem cell biology efforts in Reno, which I have not heard much about. Oh, it's there. 
There's no question. So broadly put, Doris Taylor, about eight years ago, started this unique project where she had the idea that if you take a heart and you decellularize that heart, just with, for example, perfusing it with detergent, you end up with a useful shape. You end up with a collagen-based structure that has the shape of the organ that you want. And if you just perfuse that with stem cells, they'll have the right shape to make an organ. And she actually showed that you could get a little rat heart feeding. So you decellularize a rat heart and you infuse stem cells or fetal cells from a fetal rat heart into that. They'll end up in the right place and they'll feed. Harold Ott just published a paper in Nature Medicine earlier this year where he decellularized a rat kidney, then perfused it with fetal rat kidney cells and got some histopathologic structures that kind of looked like a kidney. Tony Atala from Wake Forest has used amniotic fluid derived from mesenchymal cells to coax them down a particular differentiation pathway to try to create the cells that you can then use to repopulate that organ. The catch really, I think, lies in what I said about cell culture stress. Because if you look at the Ott paper or you look at other papers where people have tried to reanimate the kind of extracellular matrix ghost of an organ, you get pretty pictures. You get things that are recognizable as glomeruli, or at least they've kind of got that shape and they're pink on the H&E stain. And you get some kind of thing that looks like a tubule. But when you actually look at the performance of that, you see that it has proteinuria and glycosuria. So the refined phenotype that you need to actually be functional, it hasn't gotten there yet. And if you think about these ideas that you're going to use this kind of ghost bag of collagen to create an entire organ, there's an underlying heuristic there where you're assuming that there's enough information, there's enough data in the extracellular matrix to encode where exactly each one of the 32 different cell types in the kidney is going to find its home. And I don't know if you just go sort of through the binary data of laminins and collagens, you've got enough, you've got enough bits of information to dictate that. So I think the underlying, the kind of if you build it, they will come model of tissue engineering is still limited by, it's gotten to the point where you can make nice pictures, but you don't get the differentiated functionality that you need to be effective. The stem cell stuff is coming along in renal. I see our work as a vehicle to get stem cell success into patients quickly. Because I didn't put any constraints on where the cells come from that are going to populate my bioreactor. So for example, Joe Bonventry's lab at Harvard has done some really cool stuff coaxing cells along, induced pluripotent stem cells, into cells that show the appropriate markers of differentiated proximal tubule cell. The question is, can you then put them in a receptive environment so that they will actually look, they will actually perform and have the phenotype that you need for a differentiated cell? Kidneys don't tolerate too much of a percent error in their function. You don't have to leak too much albumin through your glomerulus before you get really, really sick. You don't have to have too much proximal tubule dysfunction from your Fanconis before you get really, really sick. So the the attractive histology has not yet translated into the kind of 98, 99% fidelity of phenotype that you need for a functioning organ. Interesting questions. Yes, sir. And then Jim. And thank you for the absolutely exciting talk. Uh, but I still have some questions about scalability with respect to what you showed us. Uh, you, you suggested that your uh, glomerular, glomerular filtration membrane or the silicon thing is a good stand-in for the glomerulus, but how much of big membrane do you need to uh, reproduce the, uh, I don't know, tens of thousands of glomeruli that are there in two kidneys in a human being? Now that's a great question. So it's, it's a burden and it's an opportunity. So based on the closest pack, pore packing that we can get with the existing silicon technology, we probably need a tenth of a meter squared total membrane surface area. And you can get that down into a package size about the size of a pack of cigarettes. So it's clearly small enough that you can get it inside a human subject. Now what's interesting is that you made an analogy to the massively parallel architecture of the kidney. That you've got one nephron and then you multiply that a million times and you've got a kidney. 
We actually can decouple glomerular filtration from tubular reabsorption because we have no obligation to maintain that kind of one-to-one -one match. So we can pick a degree of glomerular filtration and we can pick a bioreactor surface area or a bioreactor <coughs> length or a residence time in the bioreactor to tune the performance of the, of the overall device to what we want. So that was actually one of the first questions that we asked was, you know, if, if we do all this fancy silicon stuff and we end up with a membrane area that's the size of the North Atlantic, that's a fail and we can stop now. So we can probably pack it down into something that's kind of pack a cigarette size. My colleague at USF is a much better salesman than I and he actually has a little mock-up that he carries around to answer that question. You sell the sign of a true inventor entrepreneur, which is, that's uh, an opportunity as opposed to, yeah, that's true. If you're an intern out on a Friday night, or if you have a GI bug with vomiting and diarrhea, your, how your kidney handles salt and water is drastically different. And I was wondering if you, how would you build these kind of command and control functions into your... Open loop. Same way that dialysis works today. Dialysis, the guy jumps on the scale, technician says, okay, you're three kilos up, turn the knob to three kilos, you're good. So while I kind of made an argument that we had some features of glomerular tubular balance, in reality, if I can give a patient CKD-5, I mean, you know a patient with advanced CKD, when they get diarrhea, they're not able to drop their urine output in response, and they become horribly volume contracted, and they need to be admitted to the hospital. If I can get somebody to CKD-4 to the point where they can still be, be sabotaged by medical, by medical comorbidities like that, that's still a win because of the other, <coughs> that's still a win because they're not on dialysis. They're not having cyclic volume overload and then volume contraction. They're not nitrogen limited. That I didn't even talk on phosphorus, but they can get rid of phosphorus. Um, so we're just gonna run this open loop. Guy jumps on a scale every morning, drinks that much Gatorade. We'll see where we get. Questions? Last question. It's a very interesting talk. My question is about the turnover of these cells, nature and type of cells. If you take these primary cultures from the say, discardable tissue, it's become an issue. They have a limited turnover. If you turn stem cells into replenishable cell type, then there is a constraint on this. They will keep multiplying, something like that. <coughs> so your platform technology is going to be a disposable, like say after a few weeks you have to have a new implant and then keep working. Well, that's a great question. So these cells are clearly <coughs> contact limited, right? They stop proliferating when they bump into their neighbor. Um, we don't know, and I don't think there are cell culture models that look at what happens to a cell two years out in in vitro culture. Um, so we're probably not arrogant enough to pretend that we can just sew a gadget into a patient, kind of clap and say, you know, come back later. There's kind of early on in our concepts was the idea of sort of uh, life cycle management of a device. So we asked dialysis patients, how often would you be willing to come back for a procedure to replace your device if it got you off dialysis, if it let you go about your business, let you go to work, let you keep your job? Um, so if we have to do, uh, if we locate the device in a subcutaneous pocket like a pacer, where you're not violating any fascial planes, you can go in and out as often as you want, we could you know, replace cassettes of cells, or we could replace little modules of cells you know, every couple months in an outpatient procedure and still be okay. So I don't think we're planning that this thing's going to last forever. Um, if it lasts a little while, that's probably good enough if, you, if your gold standard is three times a week in center dialysis. Well, I really appreciate you being here, and, and thank you for this outstanding presentation. I, I think everybody here predicts that you and your company will need a lot more money than these people can give you. I, I suggest you go to the Shark Tank. Okay. <laughs> well, so you know so what? Let me explain to you what I know about sharks now. Okay. <laughs> so in reality, if you think about medical device technology and early stage investing, we've been trying to do our Series A fundraising around for three and a half years. Take a look at a company like uh, Thoratech with the LBADs. How long has it taken them to go from their initial technology development? to actually have a positive margin. I don't know that they're there yet. So if you're a responsible institutional investor and you say, gosh, 
it's going to be ninety million dollars and eight years before you get through your trials and then it's probably you're going to have to get a coverage decision from CMS and by that time somebody might have engineered a genetically modified pig that's got HLAs that allow pigs to be donor organs or somebody's come up with a cure for renal fibrosis you've got a very uncertain competitive market people are not going to invest so we are really fundamentally dependent on NIH funding even though as you said it comes in drips and dribbles you know $250,000, $50,000, $75,000 at a time. A responsible venture capitalist who looks at the economic equation isn't going to want to dump that much money into us right now. Okay. Well, I was going to predict that Mr. Wonderful, who sits in the middle of the short term, was going to tell you the same thing. And I thought that you could walk in there. <laughs> William Fitz, from Medicine Grand Rounds, University of Louisville, October 9, 2014. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much.